the role of incentives. And incentives are very closely tied to greed, by the way, right? So you need to understand the power of incentives to understand the power of greed. And this is a technical uh, example that I'm going to give. Uh, how many of you have heard of DARPA? Yeah, it's, uh, obviously a well-informed audience. DARPA, for those who haven't heard of it, is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It is an arm of the Defense Department of, uh, in the United States. It funds a lot of long-term research. They provide funding to universities, to research labs, and they have this uh, competition to find the location of 10 randomly placed 8-foot readily visible red balloons in the United States. And this was done to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the internet, by the way. Okay? So the internet was invented sometime in 1969. This thing occurred in, 19, in 2009. Uh, the winner, the team that found these 10 balloons the fastest, would get a grand prize of $40,000. Those were the terms, and that's, that's a balloon. That's balloon number 10 there that you see. And uh, about 300 teams signed up for this competition from different universities, even individuals signed up. Uh, how long do you think? Now, the United States is about 10 million square miles. You have 10 balloons, red balloons, that are located at random locations, and they were truly random. How long do you think it took the winning team to locate the 10 balloons? Any guesses? Sorry? Well, I, uh, huh? 2009, a week. Yeah, that's a very good guess. That's what DARPA thought it will take, by the way. Right? They thought it will take a few days. This competition was won by a team from MIT. They did it in six hours. It's remarkable, actually. Uh, it was a group. It was, uh, I think, the, the media lab at MIT. They started off with four people. And using social networks, it grew to 5,000 people who collaborated with them in a matter of six hours. And they were able to locate it within, uh, in that six-hour time frame. Now, even more remarkable was that the second team found, which is a team from Georgia Tech, found uh, nine balloons in about seven hours, I think, or eight hours. And there was one guy from New Jersey, Glenbridge, New Jersey, my home state, uh, who was like a Twitter expert, and uh, he had 50,000 followers, and he found eight balloons in about nine hours. <laughs> so these are, these are remarkable numbers, right? Now, the reason that MIT won is interesting, and this ties in with incentives. So they were, the approach they took was, you know what, I have $40,000 to give up that I'm going to get in prize if I win it. I will, that's $4,000 a balloon. So I'm going to give $2,000 to the guy who helps me locate the balloon. I'm going to give $500 to the guy who helps locate the guy who locates the balloon. $200 to the guy who helps locate that guy, so on and so forth. So they had a very formulaic thing that they laid out. And any money that is left, so if they find a balloon and only 3000 has been spent, they'll give the remaining $1,000 to charity. That was their approach, right? Um, now, other people could have also done it. So this, the interesting thing with this approach is there is an incentive for everybody in this chain. Somebody is getting paid a little bit to do something. They have an incentive to collaborate, right? The 250 guy is going to have an incentive to help the 500 guy, so on and so forth. The second place team decided to take an altruistic approach and said, you know what, I'm going to give everything to charity. This was your JPEG, right? And their logic behind that was when I give money, I will get some false positives. There might be guys out there who will say that they located a balloon, and then I have to spend time checking whether this guy is telling the truth or not. Right? So that was their approach. As it turns out, money won out. Money won out. So this, I'm using this example because it's a very simple example of a very controlled system where 
one entity was able to use the power of money, right, and giving small bits of money to everybody who is down this value chain to locate all 10 balloons in the shortest possible time. Now, these value chains occur every day in every business that one does. And the key success, and some people invent value chains, like Steve Jobs is a great example. He invented an entire ecosystem, right? through force of his personality, entire markets. And the, the question is, you know, are these value chains controlled, right? And if you can control them in the right way, then you have something that is really successful. When it's uncontrolled, it is greed, right? So that is the, uh, there's enormous power here, by the way, right? So as I mentioned, incentives are very closely tied to greed. There are various ways to incent people, by the way, right? You can incent people by fear. That's one way of doing it. Uh, fear is very short-lived, but greed is permanent. I mean, everybody is, I mean, it, it, is, it is this primal force that is there within us. It's not something that goes away that easily. You cannot quell it that easily, right? And the 2008 crisis, what it did was actually offer proof of concept of the power of an uncontrolled incentive chain. And I will get, I'm going to get into a little bit of detail here about how this chain organically developed. It wasn't like the Steve Jobs chain that one guy came up with it with the power of his personality, right? But it sort of developed organically and the market would have never gone through this bubble if the chain hadn't developed. And the question is, can we learn anything from this, right? So to understand this, uh, the chain that developed, I want to consider this long-term graph. Um, trying to get this pointer to work. So the the interesting, this, by the way, this graph uh, is courtesy of Robert Schiller, who is a great uh, behavioral economist at Yale University. He wrote a book called Irrational Exuberance in 2002, and he was actually managed to put together data, the data is available uh, for anyone who's interested, put together the data going back to 1880 on house prices on an inflation-adjusted basis. So you see this, uh, you see this graph, I mean, for the longest time, you see a dip in the 1920s. This is the US, by the way. It's not a global graph, uh, but we're talking about the US here. So you see this dip. This was the, the Great Depression, right? And then it sort of hung around at the same level, and suddenly you see this massive spike. And you, you end up with this massive spike, and then it collapses on itself. And this is when this uh, enormous incentive thing was set up, and then it collapsed on itself. Uh, there are a couple of other interesting things, you know, why, I'll get into, there were some special circumstances that caused this thing to happen. I'll get into that in the next slide, right? But generally, you know, you have had population growth, you have had low interest rates, there are a bunch of factors that have contributed to real estate being a preferred asset class over, over time. Population, world population, by the way, was about a billion and a half in 1900. It's, it grew by 2000. It was around seven and a half billion. Dramatic increase in world population. So all these people need to be accommodated somewhere. And how could you accommodate them? Well, you accommodated them because, you know, building costs went down, you know, building technology improved. And also the financial markets created more and more interesting ways for people to buy homes in the mortgage market. So that was the, uh, this was the setup, right? And then you had this enormous spike. Now what happened in, to cause the enormous spike? This is interesting because what really happened was there was a concerted effort, and it, this is important for you social entrepreneurs here, right? There was a concerted effort to create what was called an ownership society. The people wanted the United States government, actually, and this is where the politicians actually became a part of the value chain, 
because they were getting some, something out of it. Uh, they wanted to create more broad-based home ownership. Earlier, it used to be only rich people could buy homes, but now they wanted a number of poor guys to buy homes. They wanted to create this ownership of society, right? So banks were sort of motivated to start making these loans to poor people. Now, the banks initially were very reluctant to do it because they felt it was a bad business. But then once they started doing it, they began to realize that, hey, I'm making much more money in this than doing other things. So they co-opted. So the politicians started the value chain, and then the, the, the banks slowly started co-opting it. Right? And then, but banks cannot indefinitely make loans to poor people. At some point, the party, the music will stop. So you need to have a mechanism. They needed to come up with a mechanism to shed the additional risk that they were taking by making these loans to lower and lower credit quality people. And this is where this technology came in. It's, it is actually a brilliant innovation in finance called securitization, which allowed these banks, which has got a lot of negative press, by the way, right? But it, it, it was technology that allowed the banks to shed the risk of low quality loans into the broad markets. So they would make a loan, gather a bunch of them, shed them, and then reuse the capacity. So there was this new technology that was created. Uh, it was actually old technology that had been around for a while, but it was applied to uh, the low quality loan market. And the third element in this was the rise of hedge funds. Right? Around this time, uh, this was a complicated market, so you needed investors who understood this complicated market. Now, I run a hedge fund. We, I don't traffic in this, but a number of hedge funds were set up to buy the risk that was being shed by the banks. So they became a part of the value chain. Now, each of these guys was getting something out of it, right? So each of them was making, they felt they were making some money, and they did. They were making, they made gobs of money over a long period of time. But the list wasn't actually limited to this. Now, to support these three main players, a whole cottage industry of others got involved. Right? So I'll show that in my next slide. And here was the list. And the homeowner felt he was getting a great deal. The politician felt he was getting a great deal, banks, originators, all this entire list of eight or nine guys, right, felt that they were getting something out of it. So the entire risk system was set up that unlike the data example, the thing here was there was no cap on it. There's no 40,000 limit. These guys were determining how big it could become. So there was no regulation, so to speak of, right? So basically, and this is where the greed element comes in, is they sort of drove the market to multi-trillion levels, to huge levels, all of them. Now, there has been a lot of negative press around basically commercial banks and investment banks, but all of these actors had to be involved a bank could not have done it by themselves. All of them had to be involved to make it happen. Now, as this, as this bubble built up, slowly over time, they needed to, the risk became so high, they needed to create a bunch of toys to help manage the risk in this bubble. 